I love how we color code it. Um, green seems to be the color of hope today. So yours a little bit more shinier and <laughs> less wrinkled. A lot more shiny. <laughs> less wrinkled. <laughs> Hey folks out there, uh, I'm sitting in my office at the University of Utah at Continuing Education um, in the Go Learn office. That's the uh, travel program for the U and for the Alumni Association. Everyone who has a degree from the U and is out there, shout out to all of you. Um, and anyone else who doesn't have a degree, that's okay. Join us today at Go Learn. We're, we're not traveling, we're taking the road to you. And today we have Catherine Coles, Distinguished Professor um, with the English department at the University of Utah, uh, the Humanities College. And uh, we are hearing two essays uh, today from her book, The Stranger I Become, Essays in Reckless Poetry. Um, hello, Kathleen. Hello, Christoph. Nice um, to be here. As the room is filling, and I, will, I might have to um, recount this uh, again for those, uh, if, we, if we're having a lot more numbers coming in in the next few minutes. Um, Catherine has been the uh, um, poet, the Utah Poet Laureate uh, from 2006 to 2012. Maybe you can explain uh, to us what that means. Um, obviously, she is one of our professors here at the University of Utah. Um, she also is and was, um, um, again, tell us how this works, the poet of, in residence at Poets House, the Natural History Museum. Um, shout out to everyone up on the hill at the uh, National History Museum of Utah and the Salt Lake City Public Library, among many other things. Uh, the list of accomplishments and honors is very long. So welcome, uh, Catherine Colds. Hello. Hello. It's such a pleasure to be here. And the only thing that I regret when we do these things is that I can't see all the faces. Um, so hello to to whoever is out there, I'm thinking about you, even though I can't see you. Um, the Stranger I Become, uh, Essays in, in Reckless Poetics will be out next summer. Um, everything is slower now uh, mm -hmm. in the COVID time. Um, a friend of mine said to me recently, time is a flying turtle during <laughs> this period, which I thought was a great way to put it. I'm going to read two essays from this book. and. What I think what I'll say to introduce the idea of the book in general is that um, a friend of mine in Australia, who's a very distinguished scholar in creativity, asked, was, was curating a special issue of a journal over there on creativity, and she asked me if I would contribute. And I immediately said, well, I'm not qualified to contribute to a scholarly journal focused on creativity um, because I don't know anything about it. And she said, well, just think about it. And because she knows about creativity, she knows how these things work. And then I came back to her and I said, well, I can't say anything smart about creativity, but I can write you an essay about what I do and about how I live my life and about how my work and my life intersect with each other all at every moment, all the time. And she said, great, do that. And that was the first essay, the title essay for this book, which is not the essay that I'm gonna um, read for you today. I mean, so one of the things that the essays are constantly doing is toggling back and forth between whatever I'm doing or thinking about in my mundane, ordinary life, whether I'm having a run or visiting my father at his care center or whatever. And um, they examine the ways in which poetry both constantly comes into that life. So you're gonna have flying through these essays, little quotes from Dickinson, um, uh, especially from Dickinson Paisley Rectal, who's our current Utah Poet Laureate, will be quoted in the first essay. Um, and also uh, in the first essay, especially, there's a lot of visual art in there. And this comes out of my travels and the ways in which my travels feed into both my work and just the cultivation of my inner life. Um, and there are also lyric essays, so they're really practicing poetic technique, um, although in sentences at the same time, they're much more lyric than they are scholarly. Um, and for those of you who are a little bit nervous that poems might be flying at you a little bit too fast, and I actually start this first essay with a philosopher, um, don't worry about it. It's, I don't think that it's gonna be a problem at all. It, it, it should, I hope, all weave together. 
So what I'll say uh, about this first essay, and I'm going to share my screen now. And Catherine, I just want to remind everyone, we are letting, uh, we were talking about all your other books as well in the end of this, but most importantly about these two essays, um, post your questions and your um, uh, uh, insights or whatever you want to share with us today at the chat and at the Q&A down below on the screen. I'm going to leave the room because I'm not really important in this, but when I come back, We'll get back to all these questions, and I'm really looking forward to today's uh, two essays and presentation, learning a lot from it, and once again, walk away with uh, a greater understanding, hopefully, um, of your work. So Great. I'm leaving, but I stay here in the background, and uh, yes, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, and uh, please do post your questions um, because that's how I get to see you if I can't see your faces. So this first essay is called In the Way of Knowing and it came out of a conversation in a symposium that um, my department chair Scott Black ran here at the University of Utah on awe and attention. And one of the keynote speakers who's known um, in this essay as the philosopher of enchantment said something um, during his keynote speech and reiterated it during the conversation, it's the, almost the first thing that happens in the essay that had all of the women uh, at the symposium at least somewhat bemused. And he didn't understand what the objection was to what he had said. And this essay is kind of the response that um, I hope helps to explain what the objection was, or at least to think through the different ways in which people experience um, the comments and the philosophical constructions of other people. And he and I have been in touch back and forth talking about this um, after I wrote the essay. This is called In the Way of Knowing. And uh, the epigraph is from the novelist, Sarah Perry, who says, sometimes I forget I'm a woman. At least I forget to think of myself as a woman. A young man asks the philosopher of enchantment to explain enchantment's necessary conditions. Number three of three is woman. In Ubud, in rustic spa luxury, I stand swimsuited in a shaft of sunlight before my mirror and run my clippers nape to crown. Hair glints and falls over my shoulders, a flash in the mirror five young sarong clad men who have carried my bags and lit my mosquito coils press noses to my window. When I turn, they applaud, not they who are caught, novel. Back in the mirror, eyes on me, I resume. Mary Rufel says, when you become invisible, you become your inner life, not vice versa. Dickinson says, are you nobody too? Mm. Uh, forgive me, this is not, there we are. I can do it that way. Um, in Van Eyck's Annunciation, Mary stands by a window, hand raised to welcome or fend her visitor off, who knows, averting her gaze against him. The angel bears impossible rainbow wings. The lily at Mary's feet will not fade, though she's not depending on translation necessarily a virgin. An old story, his desire configures her body, its power ascent enough for both. I am meant to watch. The light's northern pallor, heavenly brocades celebrating the local cloth economy with what optical devices, high tech at the time, did Van Eyck affect his minute brushstrokes? Years ago, I wrote, a machine for faith never fails its cue to transport those wings and lilies still frankly send me the Holy Spirit to a dove riding a sunbeam straight into Mary's head who looks not coy, absorbed. The story teaches modesty, submission, but follow Mary's eyes. 
she gazes at the future, hatching her idea, making history. I found the words to every thought I ever had but one, and that defies me, says Dickinson. Lawrence's Lou Witt says, I am one of the eternal virgins. My dealings with men have only broken my stillness and messed up my doorways. Does archetype render us hyper visible or invisible, machines for meaning, pruned a la Williams to a perfect economy? The philosopher disagrees with Freud on all but one fact. Male violence is inevitable, he tells the young man. The son must kill his father to marry his mother. But in the story behind the painting, the father's narrative machine kills his son every time, setting others to the dirty work, tick tock. If father and son remain one and the sunbeam diving dove also, who gets the mother? Both stories transport me and again. The spa arrays itself around the house of Walter Spees, who founded the NECA Museum for Balinese Art, dedicated to making the spirit world visible in ours. My driver, Wayan, takes me to temples and sacred mountains. In my sheared head, he reads devotion. Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, animist, and takes me to a barong dance at his home village. The battle between lion king and demon queen plays out from midnight to dawn. Spees himself painted Bali's mythic fauna and intricate studies of actual dragon flies, butterflies, starfish, a long ago boyfriend, an engineer, insisted long hair on women is a secondary sex characteristic. In the presence of archetype, even scientists can't always keep their facts straight. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down. All that hair, but she can't climb out of the story. The black hair on his head, lush as his beard. My husband's locks, pale, float to his shoulders. Tall as a house, he flies them like a flag for me. I can spot him across any room. I may hide in the crowd, but he always knows where I am. Can you define the other for your own uses without changing it? In He Fumbles at Your Soul, Dickinson's God doesn't plummet down a bolt of sunlight, but fumbles, becoming plural before they drop full music on. Approach alternates with retreat. The ethereal blow about to happen continues not to, hobbled by dashes, further heard, then nearer, then so slow. Sense suspended in space, where waiting in becoming becomes its own end. Still, Dickinson depicts divine ravishment less primly than Van Eyck, scalping the soul, rendering clothing irrelevant, mind pure and simple. Hers is a full body experience. Mind makes body and vice versa. In her Annunciation, she takes on power in creating it, her pacing impeccable. Female rapture becomes in her own time, female rapture comes in her own time through the head. The womb has nothing to do with it. Mary will never again be left unsupervised. Angels loiter, magi drop in, beasts attend. Annunciations become an industry and Madonnas with little old man children standing on their knees. Almost missing is Madonna del Parto, gravid, so rare the best has her own museum in which she is stripping down for labor, desperate to have it over, I think, 
Though Paisley Rectal sees avoidance in approach. The perspective is such that if I cover the painting's top hand with a hand, top half with a hand, Mary steps forward. If I cover the lower, she shrinks back. Also, right, why have we womb worshipers so seldom painted Mary heavy, aching, afraid? Valdemar Janaschek wonders, is pregnancy just too real, too biological? Fraught with memories, as Rechtal puts it, of times the mother had torn and no one worked quick enough to cut the cord wrapped around the baby's throat. The child of the painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe peers from Mary's belly through a draped window, the, the shape of an open vagina, biological with interior decoration lit by his halo. My problem is personal. I ask the philosopher if I have a different relationship with enchantment than he because I have a womb. I mean, if your definition makes over half of us agents of enchantment available only to the other half, do you have a problem? Yes, he says, answering to be fair, only the part of the question I spoke aloud. He says, woman is the source of all life. Mother Earth, he says, Gaia, it's just a fact. In Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait, the secular master sporting a straw hat that still looks trendy today holds a woman by the hand. Her, rope, it, her robe is lined with tiny tufts of fur taken only from the soft chests of squirrels, thousands of them. Another lesson in economy, what happens to their bodies, their coarse and lively tails. Look over their shoulders at the mirror the pair from behind and facing them, the artist himself, his tunic, the blue of her sleeve, a blue deeper than the window, than the window's northern sky. The man's grip tells us he owns her dress, its fur interior, her enormous belly, everything on and in her makes her his, the future. In May, 2018, the New York Times profiled Jordan Peterson, a University of Toronto psychology professor turned YouTube philosopher, guru to disaffected young men, a few of whom expressed their inner chaos by gunning or running down women. He says, clean your rooms. Not a terrible idea, but, and chaos has been represented by the feminine forever concluding, you can't change it. He says, it makes sense that a witch lives in a swamp. The reporter notes that witches don't exist. He, purportedly a scientist, says they certainly exist. Like all the planets in our solar system, the Earth spun itself out of dust, made mostly of nitrogen and helium into a planetesimal, then finally into the ground our feet so briefly tread. Looking out my window, I see leaf and branch, rock and soil. Beyond my vision, rivers flow into the ocean from which all, er, all life on Earth came, built from carbs and lipids, proteins and acids. Until a few years ago, we believed all life required phosphorus, but scientists have discovered so now there exists a bacterium that replaces phosphorus with its toxic cousin, arsenic. There may be life forms out there, perhaps way out there, that replace carbon with silicon. Name a planet, Mother Earth, Gaia, any way you want. Ancient Egyptians called the Earth male, the sky in its distance and fire female, but naming didn't make them so. A museum teeming with demons another lined with Madonnas. 
Walter Spee's spare and gorgeous starfish. Dickinson, Van Eyck, my philosopher, you and I all evolved from one single celled organism who around 4 billion years ago, probably in a swamp, split into little wombless cell, little fact, thanks for your ambition. Nature worked it out. Put all your eggs in one basket. You have to surveil it. You can't let it loose to roam. Nature, on the other hand, sets little bombs everywhere and lets them explode. Complex life may have evolved and died out many times before our higher order ancestors arrived and eventually dreamed up witches. But for over 80% of that time, the earth belonged to bacteria and archaea, and there were a lot of them, are a lot. Phytoplankton generate half the world's oxygen, and we create male and female, we created male and female remain a tiny minority. The terms don't apply to fungi, lichens which may live forever, reproduce asexually. Some lower plants reproduce through parthenogenesis, as do the odd scorpion, bee, velvet worm, goblin spider, pigeon, and turkey. There is an entirely asexual, all-female whiptail lizard. There is a rose-breasted grosbeak in Pennsylvania who is female on one side and male on the other. The female kobudai fish may become male at reaching her majority. When a female at attains the top of the clownfish matriarchy, the dominant male will change to female and replace her in the ranks. Who could resist enchantment? My problem is personal because it's biological. Where difference exists, who is different and who decides what that means? As Guy Claxton says, I am who I am because I am a body, this one, female among other things, queer in its ways to me, normal, chaotic as any, no more. Every pleasure and enchantment that takes me takes this flesh, which has a womb, also an appendix, or did, though I noticed its presence no more than I do now, its absence, and many times less, I am sure, than any man I know, forgive me, thinks of his penis. Are you thinking of it now? Most days of my life, when has my womb ever occurred to me, unless in the moment it was being inconvenient? I've thought less about reproduction than pleasure or love, which pre and post date my fertility. My husband and I have no children by choice, but even a woman who connects pleasure with that kind of creation will vastly most of the time work to prevent rather than enable it. It's possibility an impediment to, not a vehicle for enchantment. Her tools for doing so may make her a witch. Male imagining may constrain her or burn her. Enchanted, I am my least gendered beside myself, self and estranged, taken not by otherness, but within it, my animal body, its desire and pleasure, its fiery orbits, its suspension and velocity in time, freedom, surrender. A woman, I forget to think of myself. I forget the gaze that writes me over, Madonna or witch, and gaze beyond the frame, betraying nothing. Under the microscope in the lab, diatoms, golden, arrayed with spines and tails and jewel-like structures, tiny parachutes, elaborate balloons too small to see except through miraculous lenses. No ordinary creatures, breathers out, givers of life, ancient ones who will survive us, joining as we do into colonies fantastically shaped. Stars, streamers, fans, defined by bodies. No life like this. 
beauty slips its knots, passing strange and real. Given a choice, taking one, I choose the sky. Then again, earth, is it different for you? And I'm gonna stop sharing uh, my screen with that slideshow. And uh, I'm gonna bring up another slideshow to share with um, for the next essay, which is, hmm? no, I think I learned this before I actually have to, get out of that, perfect. And into this, sorry everyone, this will just take a second. And now share that. Probably making Ben crazy. There we go. Um, this is the, the essay that follows the one that I just read and um, these are the only two pieces of work I think I've ever done in which I've addressed the question um, of my hair that people, some people have asked me about over, over time. Um, and this one, in this essay, somebody asks me about it quite, quite specifically. So uh, if you um, need an answer or some set of answers to that question, I'm not gonna claim that you're gonna find them here. You probably won't. Um, this is also uh, uh, an essay that partly addresses my father's uh, long decline into dementia. He passed away quite sadly to, for me last February, but fortunately in time uh, for us to be with him when he died, which is uh, a gift that wasn't given to quite a lot of families who were in the same situation around that time. Um, the title of this uh, essay is Filament, and you'll see that it has a couple of epigraphs um, from late Latin filare to spin, from Latin phylum thread, and then uh, from Dickinson, but tis a single pair. Light, light as air, I'm gonna actually go back, sorry, error. Light as air, nearly a tungsten filament. Jar it, shake it, step wrong on the ladder under the chandelier. It breaks for any reason, no apparent reason. If you see no trace of soot, if glass remains perfect, shake the light bulb and listen for bright music. It's gone. One of our hardest elements, tungsten burns white hot without melting. In a closed globe, deprived of oxygen, it won't flame. Incandescent bulbs burn your fingers, they waste themselves. Light as air, nearly, only most women know hair is anything, but even when, as mine did, it flits, glimmers, proves, dissolves, as Dickinson put it, glancing where the sun touches. Hair can hurt you if you sleep on it wrong or it dries funny, barrettes hurt, elastics hurt, hairpins ornamented or not, cowlicks hurt. Imagine being a sister in a fa famous circus set performing the hair hang. I have to apologize, I'm missing a slide, but that's all right, you're gonna to have to imagine this. Um, imagine being a sister in a famous circus, circus set performing the hair hang, braid a steel cable into your hair, filament, 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 launched out of itself, as Whitman says, then allow it to loft you into the upper reaches of the tent. Hold your pose under hot lights, toes pointed, arms flickering. The guardian says, that's not a torture technique, that's entertainment. You hardly eat. The heaviest Elias sister weighs 115, the lightest 90, whittled, feminine. You know the physics of spin. It doubles your weight, its pressure on your scalp. 
nerve rich, exquisitely tender, communing with the brain, which while processing pain for the finest wild hair itself feels nothing. A surgeon can cut into it without anesthetic, can shock it to create sensation or tremor elsewhere in the body, displaced. Perhaps hair acts as the brain's otherwise absent sensory system, hurting in the brain's place. I know, hair doesn't hurt. It hurts a direct object. Many women, maybe most, have had their heads forced back by the hair, brought to ground by pain. My childhood friend calls it her dead matter, but I imagine the brain's electricity reaching the skull and instead of turning back on itself, extending outward, follicle by follicle, hair raising. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant, our lady of pure lyric instructs. An electrified animal in my brain persists in trying which lines of Dickinson's I can replace with lines from others of her poems with similar texture. I can swap out the first and third lines from tell all the truth but tell it slant with those of to be alive is power, to get to be alive is power, success in circuit lies without a further function, the truth's superb surprise. That this might almost convince you is partly a tribute to Dickinson's famous and deceptive formal regularity and entirely rooted in circuit, which involves literal power, electrons flowing around a closed path. Absent narrative, the poems work by substitution. Slant and circuit make geometric gestures, a line's infinite extension beside a circle's closure, so irreconcilable as to prohibit or annul the metaphor almost altogether. So the metaphor in Tell All the Truth fails, as all good metaphors must, though not all so completely success indifference lies and the poem must begin in extreme difference in order to fail as it does with movements that likewise oppose each other insisting on equating lightning to the children easing with truth dazzling gradually if a metaphor fails too fully it carries us into nonsense or surrealism Dickinson fails with breathtaking precision. The gaps she opens don't suck us into chaos. They suspend us, spinning, agonized, exhilarated, in a brilliant maelstrom, in a web of light. I can't hold a candle to her, though I have a transparent sphere, a whisper of element heating up. She'll take off the top of your head. When I first cut my hair 30 years ago, it wasn't quite short enough to make children stop and stare, nor yet to elicit envy from women whispering, I wish, nor to beguile strangers to ask to touch my head, nor to cause gentlemen in their cups to cast their memories back to our school years and lament, how could you? What they mourn so many decades later has nothing to do with me. Extinguished youth, faded potencies, privilege maybe, a grip they imagine they've lost. Their misreading. Dis discretion, direction. I might have slanted my eyes at you, glancing, sidelong, inviting, annoyed, you couldn't tell, unable to close and electrify that particular circuit, unless I turned and faced you head on. My canniest friend of 20 years looks at old photos and asks why I cut it off. Is she sentimental for something she never saw, for lightness, for deception? Are we all? Nothing could be more obvious. She wants to know everything. 
light, a narrow stream of gas rises from the sun in a nebula, an interstellar cloud. When my father accused me of keeping my head in the clouds, this was what I felt, feel, lift, detachment, flame, vast distance into which all, not least myself, can vanish and will. Galaxy filaments are the largest cosmic structures we know, but almost certainly not the largest extant. They limb the borders where voids meet, but how do we find a place where nothing joins nothing? The numbers move us, the poem shuttles us through lines we hardly know how. If the universe is a web, who wove it? By what architecture? With eight delicate legs, eight fingers and two thumbs, the digits we always thought to count on. In the corner of a barn between two bushes, at a loom before the fire, with clicking needles, her back to the wall all day, only at night, spinning straw into gold, keeping pattern in mind. Penelope tore out her work nightly and started over. Like Dickinson through evasion, she chose her master, the absent one who left her until he didn't. The spider eats her work and spins it again out of herself, ingenious recyclist. My childhood friend's braid was gold, thick as my bicep. Unwound, her hair might have been her glory. Dead, she would say, excreted, gathering it into her hands, her lip curling. There's the hair spinner, my apologies. Say lamp incandescent, as my father has been with rage, with joy, as he was in numbers illuminating his brain, firing off its mathematical places. On a functional MRI, my brain lights up, all of it, no matter if I'm reading a poem, turning a tetrahedron inside out to flap and fly, or awaiting instructions. The brain of my friend Fred, like my father, a mathematician, works discreetly, efficiently. On screen, I've watched it devote one brilliant little bit of itself to a poem, an entirely different corner to manipulating geometric shapes. Otherwise, the house beneath his skull remains dark. Later, he tells me I was meant only to rotate and meditate on the 3D shapes, not open wide and animate them, unfolding, refolding. Who knew? The word manipulate means something to a mathematician, other things to a poet, as may the word read. Consider my father's brain as it now is, lamps under his still full head of hair switching off room by room, leaving little islands of light. From inside one, he can't cross to the other through what the doctor calls white matter, by which he means dead matter, turned off. His boundaries forgot, my father can't speak of his inability to move between chambers from one corner to another of that web. He can't speak of anything. Unable to navigate his brain, his words can't come together with each other with what they name. When he sees me, he smiles and waves. I put myself in his gaze and he watches me hard, listens to what I say, opens his mouth, fails to speak. Plying from knot to knot, I wonder what at any moment he remembers, what room he inhabits. Does himself himself inform? How can I say? A year ago, I said to him, I wish you could tell me how you experience time. And he began to weep. Penelope's weaving erased days. Dickinson counted nights, poem by wild poem. 
former mandolinist and banjo plucker who took me to hear Pete Seeger, Arlo Guthrie, the, Ind the Indigo Girls, Lyle Lovett, and the Grateful Dead. My father knows he dislikes Lawrence Welk. When I wheel him into the activities room where champagne music bubbles from the television, he musters, no. And I wheel him out, up and down hallways through cold gardens. When I take him back, he repeatedly sighs until I lean over and say, this never was our kind of music. He cracks up. When I say, do you know I love you? He laughs again. To be alive is power, but not necessarily freedom. Electricity gathers, builds, looks for a place to go. It travels only where drawn. Crackle and spark, it lifts your hair to the brush, lights the sky or the nerves, trap it inside the glass. It works for you. The human body conducts impulsive, nervous, wired. It carries a current to ground and sings. Just thinking about it makes your hair stand up. Years ago, I was drawn up an escalator behind a woman with the most beautiful hair I've still ever seen. Brown shot through with pale gold, cascading well below her waist, so thick you could have made a bed of it. Sometimes when I can't sleep, I imagine wrapping myself in a cocoon of hair where I hide, changing into something else. Sometimes I dream I wake up in a hotel room, my unexpectedly long hair knotted like a web. I have people to meet. I have no comb, no comb. Even admiring, not immune to beauty, I saw how all that hair tilted the woman's head back, how much it must weigh, not to mention the weight of eyes. I wonder if she ever cut it off. Years later, a woman introduces me to an audience by assuring that, uh, them that I am entirely without vanity. She quotes an interview I gave to a reporter for a church-owned newspaper who asked why I'd cut my hair. Because, I said, when I account for myself, I don't want to confess I spent 10,000 hours on coiffure. In her careful blonde do, without irony, my introducer imagines me, the gates, St. Peter, totting up hours on his clipboard. Anyone who thinks I'm not vain hasn't been paying attention. To be alive is pleasure, I might say. Nobody's but my own. My friend from India died at her kitchen sink, looking out the window into tree limbs laced with light. A vessel exploded in her head and she was discharged. She had never cut her hair. When she let it loose, it fell to the floor. My husband's mother died at 56 of a cancer blown to her brain. The surgeon opened her skull and removed what he could without taking too much of her. Shaving the hair kept beautifully golden since her reign as a beauty queen. After chemo started, the shaving didn't matter, nor surgery. I think of her head filling and shedding, her kind hearted self pressed out of herself by that object generated by her body, foreign to it. I think of her body losing heart, filling with absence, its fear. My father's hair, still thick, is more steel than pepper. I would rather have in my age my mother's, which glances and shines pure platinum, as I once had and abandoned her burnished goldenness in my golden youth. I hope I have a brain that stays, like hers, mostly intact. At 60, already I feel the world recedes. I ask my canniest friend, is it not a burden? 
She takes scissors to it at her bathroom sink, leaving behind enough for a handhold. He hasn't spoken more than one word at a time for over a year. Today, as he's never done, my father lifts both hands toward my just shorn skull. I bend my head into his palms where he holds it, touching lightly. It was years before I noticed the comb still in the bottom of my travel bag in case of what? and removed it. That's it. Wow. Beautiful. Um, very thought provoking for me, <clears throat> as you can imagine. Um, thank you for reading it to me because uh, I'm an English as a se second language uh, a challenged person, um, um, but every this is poetry. I think like every you say one sentence, I have ten thoughts, and I have to keep up with your next sentence. Trying cannot even finish what I was just what what you just put in my head, um, and and I will watch the recording of this again to make sure I catch even more because there, there is so much more. If, you, if anybody has questions, um, the first essay alone is, is, is loaded to me, of course. And, and I, as someone who's been raised by, by mothers, so you know my mom um, and my father split when I was a baby. So I was raised by, by women and um, the, the power of a woman is, it's just with me. It's instill, instilled with me. Um, sadly, I was not around for my grandmother's passing also be, be, right before COVID and I haven't been able to go back. So mm -hmm. that's, heavy, that's, that's heavy on my heart. And I never thought of, of everything you said, you know, and question myself very deeply. And the second one, um, also, both of them obvious, obviously personal. So, um, the second essay to me, we lost my father, my mother in law, to um, a melanoma, um, a, a, a not, so to speak, benign brain tumor, but you know, it ultimately kills. So, and that was also just right before um, COVID nineteen. Um, we were, were you able were you able to have um, a memorial celebration for her before everything yes. shut down exactly yeah. right before and but more importantly her memorial brought out a lot of people and it it showed us all the support and and the love that we had and we never knew we would have um, people mm -hmm. people from her past from a very very past there were ski instructors from park city coming down um anyway um um, the most important thing for me um, in that situation was to be able to be there for her passing. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, the final essay in this book it ha has that scene from my father's passing. And we were so fortunate, my, my mother and both my brothers and I, and then um, t his two granddaughters were all present at his bedside. Um, at the moment that he passed. And we did not, uh, we were expecting to do a big memorial celebration in the spring. And of course that didn't happen. And we finally have just scheduled a Zoom celebration that we're putting together for um, the end of the first week in, in December. And I was the one who kept clinging to the idea of having a big party for him and for all his friends, but they're in their nineties now. And my brother persuaded me that we don't want to lose anyone, right? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, we were we were lucky in, at this point in time, uh, especially in Utah. We were not affected um, yet, and it was literally around the corner. So, um, we we did have that farewell, and it and it 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 was very important to us. I don't know how things went in your family, but um, the 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 operation on her brain was so, somewhat 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. our, our farewell was in, in a lot in, a, in stages over years. 
and I wish my wife was here. Obviously, that's her mother, so it's her story, really, not mine to tell. Um, yeah. But uh, she, you know, it's it's the um, the passing in increments that's yeah. so hard. And, and people's finally, journeys with yeah, people's journeys with that are so different, and also the experience of the people who love them. So I know that there are people who really loved my father who felt that they lost him long before he died. And as I hope you can tell from the essay, I felt as if I had a relationship with him, a really profound one, um, even though I'm a creature of words uh, and in many ways, so is he a creature of words, a profound relationship that happened almost entirely in the absence of his being able to speak at least. And um, it was, the essay was so beautiful to me because the uh, different rooms you were describing, um, you know, e even finding some images that actually your, your husband created uh, um, with the uh, Ski Institute, um, Chris Johnson, um, you brought it, you brought it you brought it to me like I never thought about um, the dementia, Alzheimer, um, brain tumor, whatever can happen to someone's brain. And you, you said, you know, the things a physician could operate on and you wouldn't feel anything, yet it creates almost everything and all these different rooms that you're in and who knows which which one has the light on. And it, and it was very beautiful. It, it, I, again, I need. I will rewatch the the recording. I missed so much as I my brain was going 100 miles an hour, um, and and we do have. Let's see what we got here. Um, um, yeah, so, um, Wynn is writing. I don't have any questions. Uh, just want to say how wonderful and thought provoking this was. Looking forward to the book. I I wholeheartedly agree. I I'm very much looking forward to the book. I'm very much looking forward to finishing. Um, some other of your works, um, not to distract from this right now, but uh, um, th this like double journey along my grandmother's far flung path. Um, um, I look both ways. I highly recommend it. And then something that even makes me laugh and smile, um, speak, you know, a, a mustache party and penguins and, and, and ice in the Ar Antarctica. For those who are in the room who might not know, um, Catherine was sent to the Antarctic to write about it by the U.S. National Science Foundation Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. So, um, but let's take hopefully some more questions. We have a, a chat question that I would see. Do you use the images in the book, Pamela is asking? Um, that is, uh, the, the final version is under construction, and I had assumed not because, you know, it's, it's really quite expensive. But I heard quite recently from my publisher that they're thinking about using some of the, these images. Most of these essays were written um, either like on request for the first one, as I described, but um, most of them were actually written because I was asked to do a talk on a subject for a conference. And so most of them do have slideshows uh, along with them. And I'm not sure which ones my publisher is gonna decide to use. I think not all of them, but probably some of them. Uh, can I go back and say something about Chris's yeah. ima brain image? Mm -hmm. He, my husband, um, who, uh, may, am I allowed to brag on my husband a little? He's quite Absolutely, a brilliant you should. computer brilliant. scientist uh, <laughs> training in, in physics. And uh, what he does w among the many things that he does is, um, is simulate and visualize the electrical activity of both the heart and the brain as they propagate through the different materials in the body. And I hope that's clear um, enough. And I actually understand most of it because I proofread all his papers for him. So I have a pretty good idea of what he, what he does, but he originally was really specialized and focused on the heart. And he turned to doing the work on the brain in response to his mother's illness. He wanted to help brain surgeons really focus in and locate. I think at the time that he started the work, if the, if the site of an epileptic seizure, uh, the origin in the brain is maybe the size of a pea, they had to remove a piece of the brain the size of a golf ball in order to get rid of that 
the site of that seizure. And so his work with surgeons was to minimize, minimize, min minimize the amount of material from the brain um, and also to help them really identify and localize the location of whatever anomaly is there. So his mother's illness really inspired him in that direction. That's, I'm, I'm hope many people have benefited from Chris's work already and it's continuing. We'll have some question. Um, so Erica says, thank you for sharing your powerful and brilliant imagery with me. Um, and then Bonnie has an, a, a real question with, not, a, not that this wasn't a question, it was a, a thank you for the uh, comment, Erica. But Bonnie has a question we, we might find an answer to. Uh, it's puzzled uh, me how people seem to view poetry and prose as having a sharp delineation. But your <laughs> essays seem to move in between what are your views on this? Um, so one of the things that I uh, say to my PhD students, PhD students these days tend to go through at least a period, um, and I'm not sure whether it ever ends or not, where they want to say, there is no such thing as genre. And my response to that is, well, except that we've used generic categories for centuries because because they're useful to us, right? In, deli in delineating and talking about literature um, by putting it into certain categories. And yet, um, I think that for me, one of the things that I'm trying to enact in this book is the way in which um, poetry itself is present to me all the time. Um, sometimes just below the surface, if I'm um, you know, actually working on or doing something else that requires my attention. But if I'm vacuuming or washing the dishes, right? Poetry is like there at my level of consciousness all the time. And for me to enact that in prose required the prose also to be um, existing on that borderline um, between poetry and prose. and. Uh, I'm teaching a class to undergraduates right now in um, women poets, and um, I'm trying to make sure that they talk about um, all lined verse as poetry because technically that's what it is. But we just moved into, in the last part of the semester, lyric prose, where we're thinking about the difference between poetry that comes to us in lines, the way Dickinson and Whitman come to us, uh, although Whitman pushes at that, right? And poetry that comes to us in sentences and what the difference is and what that means. And for me, to use a sentence means for one thing that I'm existing in a different time space with the language and it also means that i'm um that i'm not disciplining the language to quite the same extent that i'm disciplining it when it has to when every line has to be its own unique specific thing the sentence gives me more space that is something that i noticed because you know when i enter like when i pick up a poetry book you think of these rhythmic um static things in a way who then create thought and provoke ideas and things like that with yours at least the one in an actor car uh, that i read um, thus far it always just i had to learn to just put myself into the room and i just read it like it was and to me it was more it was more helpful to be fluent and to not look necessarily at each paragraph so is this what you're describing because it all of a sudden became more of a story than it was a poem. And it pulled me in, it made me laugh. You know, it made me, um, you're describing at one point um, how helpless penguins are compared, you know, and humans, you draw this comparison between us as two creatures and all of a sudden the penguin slips into the water and it, it wows you, it, it awes you, kind of stuck with me a little bit, you know, how we're all, yeah. how we're all trying to be like some somewhat that we might not be, you know, and maybe if we just let loose and or get into a, some water that we all appreciate and love, we'll we'll turn into um, an expert. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly, an expert. And you know, you said at the beginning, I feel like I haven't, I wasn't able to take everything on board. And one of the other things that I tell my students and also audiences is when you're confronted with poetry, um, and I do think of of this book, although it's in prose as a form of poetry. Um, and especially when it's being read to you and you don't get to one of the great 
things about the pages, you can go back, right? And think, wait a minute, I missed something. And go back, you can't do that when I'm reading to you. And I always say, you know, don't relax, don't, you should just relax. I mean, let it, let it carry you. There's not going to be a quiz at the end. There's no examination or anything that you have to pass. Just relax. And the text will be there uh, in the end if you need to refer to it. But it is a different different kind of experience, right? Um, but it's very much an experience and one that you have to just sort of release yourself into. Yeah, that's exactly what, what I had to think of myself today when you were reading is, is dude, go with it. <laughs> Don't get stuck relax. on what you just said. Uh, go with it and relax and yes. Um, and that, it, was, it was wonderful and, and I have to say, um, um, it definitely changes um, my my future um, book choosing. I, I tend to be someone who picks up uh, historic fiction, you know. <laughs> and, I like uh, historic fiction too, and mysteries. I'm a big mystery lover. Right. So so I tend to live in in that that you know. Oh, great! I understand something about the history of this, and then somebody spins it into a story, and I can enjoy it. But I I will say that I will probably uh, not skip the poetry section as fast as I as I used to do, thanks to you. So, so thank you very much. Oh, good. That I absolutely very will glad. look for. Um, I will ask you for your favorite poets that are currently, you know, uh, 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 working and creating um, pieces. So we'll stay tuned on that one. We'll be in touch. Um, if there anybody else has any questions, we have three. I think we're good. Um, I think you got them all. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, thank you for for doing this, and I I uh, um, I, I I have so many more questions, especially about the first essay, and I I, I need to reflect. I need to probably work all, uh, things through as a male representative uh, um, of of our culture, you know, and and um, I I. There are many things that really have resonated with me, and and I were I'm not I'm not living in a female body, and to 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 hear your words was very important for me today. So this was. Oh, I'm glad. I I realized it was a little bit of a risk to begin. It's kind of a challenging um, essay. I've only read it to academic audiences before, but it fit closely with the other one and so I thought it made sense to try to do them to together and just and kind of see what would would happen um I think one of the things that I'm really trying to deal with that within that is the way in which the culture creates paradigms and assertions that are flatly contradicted by science and yet they're used um, as mechanisms of control and this happens across lines of gender, but also lines of race, um, as we're thinking about so importantly right now as well. Yeah, and you know, some of the, uh, many of the uh, um, pieces of art that you showed in it um, were known to me. And they were known to me for, you know, the art history point of view and whether it's pre-Renaissance, like you said, these uh, little male bodies who stand on, on Mary's uh, lap, you know? Yeah. Um, I always, I always was laughing how they had, how Jesus, baby Jesus had actually a, a, a shadow uh, as if he's growing a beard already. Um, so from that angle, I knew all this, but I, 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 I really feel enlightened um, to talk about it um, from a, from a different angle to see these artworks, you know, the Von Nikes and, and, and um, that was powerful to me, very powerful. So, well, you know, Van Eyck is my favorite painter, right? So when I'm when I'm having this sort of relationship with the painting and thinking about it in this way, at the same time, I'm talking with my favorite painter um, of all time. And so that for, for for women, and I think also for people of color, that's a very complicated relationship to have with your culture. We have two comments, and then I think we can wrap up. Pamela has, has a question. Would you like to see this book cross-referenced in bookstores? And if so, in which sections? Yes, so uh, she's asking if if she would like to look for this book that you were just reading out from once it's out, in what section would we find it in the bookstore? I 
think it will probably end up in the nonfiction section. I should have a conversation about this with my publisher because I, what she has in mind, I, I have no idea because it really does straddle, um, you know, if there were a poetics section, then probably that's where I would put it, but there would only be about six books uh, in there is my guess. Um, it, but I think it could go in literary theory, it could go in essay, it could go in um, maybe in memoir in a weird kind of way. Um, the threads in it, are there's a lot of science in it. There are animals just all over the place um, in this book, in, including animals I live with, both inside and outside my house. And uh, I meant to say that so. too, that the, your, your, your amazing ability to bring science in this and make us, mm. you know, to me, that was really another point where I had sort of goosebumps, kind of like where you were uh, talking about, you know, these little creatures that we barely, that we most, for most parts don't see, who will outlive all of us. That just, you know, it puts like, uh, yeah, who, who the hell are we anyway to be so presumptuous to think that this is our planet, this is our, you know, we can do whatever we want to do. I mean, the human race has has a, I mean. Yeah, and one day, you know, we're all going to be gone, not just like on an individual, the, the whole race, we, this planet will exist, but we won't as a, as a, as a thing on it will not be, we will have transformed our, our carbon That's will right, be in right. some other thing, right? It's, yeah, it, it and, and really everything th will be transformed. Yeah, everything will be transformed. I actually have an essay about this, but um, when it's all gone, if we destroy the earth, life will continue and it will come back in a, in a different form. The thing that is very likely gonna be the same after the insects or really similar is birds. There will probably be birds early on for good evolutionary um, reasons. Yeah. And uh, we live, we have lived with a macaw. Um, my husband lived with a macaw for 42 years and now we live with a very young little Senegal parrot in our house That's right. um, many many birds that we feed outside uh, the house and so I find all of this fascinating and just really quickly the slides of diatoms actually were taken um, in Antarctica from samples that I took from the water um, down there and tell me that they're not enchanting tell me that there's not enchantment right outside the idea of the of there's a particular female organ um, involved. I find them to be utterly enchanting. Yeah. Uh, final comment, I guess. Uh, let's see, Marcy is saying, thank you, Catherine, for sharing your beautiful work. Your comments on this, on, 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 on this question about genre eliminate the uh, strong voice in the text, one that grows from itself and not an imposed structure. I look so forward to reading your book when it comes out. Perfect ending. And I look forward to seeing all of you in person. I'm hoping that when the book comes out, we'll be in the after time and we'll be together. Yes. Likewise. So thank you very much, Catherine. I know you're such a busy woman. So thank you for your time and, and for this, these beautiful two essays. And I have some thinking to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks to everyone who came.